the Vasana can be insight, but it can also be seeing things clear. <coughs> and these two are very uh, important and inseparable because we need to see clearly to then go deeper. So that's as simple as that, basically. <laughs> Gonna, it could be a lot more complicated, but I think uh, simple is always uh, very good. So, and what we're going to do uh, here is basically based on the early Buddhist texts. So, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with this, this is called the suttas, the discourses of the Buddha. So, uh, the early texts are preserved in Pali, which is the language that most of Spoke. There's many different ideas and opinions about that. I'm not going to go into this, but <laughs> um, I know there is quite an advanced Pali scholars here, so uh, I will uh, try to navigate the middle way here. Um, so, and we, in this practice, we use the Brahma Viharas, which is basically the teaching that the Buddha gave. Uh, or beginning uh, in a lot of cases. For example, we have a clear demonstration of this in the Maharaunava, which is the greater discourse to Rahula, uh, where, in fact, uh, Rahula, Buddha's son, uh, was following the Buddha, his father, uh, on all ground in the morning. And uh, through an intervention of the Buddha, uh, his son decided that he would go meditate, uh, or try to meditate, because he didn't really know what he was doing. So he was very young, he was probably a very young, the youngest member of the Sangha at this point. And he sat under the tree, and then the Buddha, when I was the Buddha, saw him and he said, well, why don't you practice Anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing? And then, not knowing what, what that meant, uh, he went to the Buddha in the evening and uh, he asked uh, his father, the Buddha, to please give him the instructions on mindfulness of breathing. And the Buddha, interestingly, did not give him the instructions right there. He said to his son, first, Ramana, you should develop Boundless love, loving kindness. Then you should develop boundless compassion. Then you should develop boundless joy. Then you should develop boundless calm. I know the uh, calm in this context. Uh, you will see uh, throughout this retreat, I will explain a few important choices. I will mainly be reading from my own translations. Uh, so these uh, when you speak words that uh, are relatively new, but it will make sense as we go along. And so in this uh, sutta, uh, to this, this discourse to Ramuda, it's quite clear that the Buddha, we have a quite good example that it's probably what he taught most of the time to the people who were just beginning the path. Because these four Brahmanivaras, when they are practiced uh, in, in this sequence, are very, very powerful uh, and cleansing agents of the mind and purifiers of the mind and, and the heart. They will really quickly clean the slate in the heart, and the, the mind and heart will become very, very, very wholesome, very so these states are not to be uh, underestimated or neglected. They are like the highway to the higher teaching, basically. And so this is why we begin with this, because uh, I know still today of no faster path than to begin with those. Not that we're in a hurry, but <laughs> uh, definitely uh, this practice uh, goes quite deep, quite fast. So. And then the, the framework of this practice is based on another sutta, which is called Metta Sahadatta Sutta. It's the sutta in the Sanyutta Nikaya, which is found in the Bojanga Sutta, which means the factors of awakening, basically. 
the chapter of the practice of awakening, and the Buddha explains what is the limit of each of these phenomena have us, um, and where do they stop, and how to cultivate them. So, without going into great depth into this, I just want you to know the structure of what we're going to do uh, during these 10 days, because I think it's really important to know that this is actually really anchored in the original teachings of the Buddha, uh, just so you know, in the Buddha, so we're not making this up. <laughs> And uh, uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to explore all of this together in the next few days. And my next point would be, uh, and that was uh, a bit how one day we learned he would start, usually he would say, um, he would put a lot of emphasis on listening and following the instructions as they are given. And that is for your own good. When you follow the instructions, uh, word for word, and really commit yourself fully to, to the instructions given, then you will experience very deep and fast progress. Alternatively, uh, there are always uh, people who will not necessarily pay heed to all the instructions and will try to mix many different teachings and that always takes a lot of time <laughs> and it creates a lot of confusion, unnecessary confusion and then we have to kind of untangle everything so it takes a lot a long time so if you please listen to the instructions and do yourself a favor listen to the instructions, follow them very closely, as, as best as you can, and you will see, you will go through all the fetters very quickly. Uh, or impediments, I can say. Is it okay? Should I speak slower? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So, yeah, as so they would say, yeah, don't mix practices, they, they don't actually mix very well. You've done other, other uh, types of one-pointed uh, types of meditations, like uh, one-pointedness one and things like that. It, it, it just doesn't uh, it just doesn't mix very well. So please listen to the instructions, and I uh, hope this really works for you. And without further ado, the instructions. <laughs> so. We could go in a long, elaborate way to explain the whole playful path and, and all this, but uh, the core of the Ariwata um, Nikuma, the eightfold path of the arrogance, the awakened people, the good path, the heart of it is what I call wise practice, Samamaya, which is basically uh, normally called right effort. And why is right effort so important? It's because that's what we do. <laughs> uh, the rest is very helpful. And it's, for example, the, the virtues, which we will talk about uh, later. Uh, I just want to focus on the meditation here. They will be of great support and benefit for our meditation. But really, what we're doing here is right effort. This is like uh, when you have a sentence, you have, well, in English, we have, for example, subject verb complement or subject verb object and then uh, here languages usually would have a uh, subject object verb for example but um, this right effort is like the verb of the path basically this is what we're doing this is the action the action verb of the sentence of this tender retreat and what is this well Again, it could be very complicated and elaborate, but really it boils down to two main things that I like to see it. Is one is letting go, and two is uplifting the mind. So this is also called um, abandoning unwholesome states of mind or heavy states of mind and cultivating 
uplifted states of mind, which make the mind very clear, very still, very joyful, happy, and aware. And so, in this process, um, this practice, we in this practice we call it the six arts, basically. And this is what we do when the mind gets distracted. But I will get into that in a second. This will be the second portion of the instructions. So in um, in my in my book, I, I open the instructions with uh, a quote from Rumi because uh, I think the Buddhist instructions are amazing. But uh, Rumi's very short sentence is also really good. Is uh, close your eyes, follow the stay there. <laughs> And I think um, if you get confused at any point, and if you just leave that, you will be somewhere good. <laughs> so if you if you start with that, you're already on the right track. And then I can elaborate a little bit more and say, first, now this is what we're going to do. You want to bring up the feeling of metta, the feeling of I call it boundless love. Some people call it loving kindness. It doesn't matter the name we give it. It's that warm feeling, that warm feeling that is glowing inside your chest. When you remember a happy memory, uh, someone you love, uh, it can be um, a place of nature that you really love, that you this comes up very naturally for you. I'm just curious, does anybody here, uh, does everybody relate to that? Can everybody think if you can just nod your head on something? Okay, maybe. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> so really, anything that will uh, remind, you, remind you of that happy feeling inside your heart that just, uh, I like to think of it as like a drop of ink in a glass of water. It's like this drop goes in, in the water and then it's like this in the heart and then it spreads. And then it just spreads all over your body and if you just let it spread. You don't have to push anything if you just Continually, you remember that this happy memory, this will arise quite naturally, and it will just pervade your whole body. And so then, just allow, allow it to do that. Allow it to pervade. Don't try to force it. Only, only uh, cultivate that state. One thing that can help is to repeat some sentences like. May I, may I be happy. Uh, may I experience calm and peace. May I feel love for all human beings. Whatever the verbal formulation that you use doesn't matter. It's actually the feeling that you feel that does matter. So whatever it is that you are thinking or imagining or thinking about, what matters is that you feel genuinely this feeling of love. Okay, good. <laughs> now we're ready to move on to the next step. So when, whenever that will start to grow, you will see it's like a it's like a plant or like a creeper. It will start to it will start to spread and take hold, and it will and it will become steady around your heart, and it will take root. And when we feel ready, in this particular uh, twin tradition, we, we emphasize using now a spiritual friend. And that spiritual friend is someone that you love, that you respect. When you think of them and their good qualities, you have this natural inclination, this propensity to feel love and gratitude friendship, and this actually nurtures your uh, your loving kindness. 
now three things to watch for in this uh, choosing this spiritual friend, which can cause problems sometimes for, for some people. And it's good to consider is to remember that um, what we're trying to develop here is not associated with the physical attraction. We're speaking of universal love. So it's not related to uh, gender attraction or if you're in the LGBTQ uh, community, whatever gender attracts you or you attract them. <laughs> so it's not about that. And so it, usually we advise to take uh, someone that is the same gender as you or if you are uh, if your inclinations are otherwise then then make sure that there's no basically there's no physical attraction in, in, in this spiritual way. that it remains clean clean and clear so and then um, members of family are very can be a very good object uh, a very good spiritual friend um, Although one thing to watch for is that uh, sometimes uh, they can be a little too close, <laughs> and sometimes they can uh, they can uh, trigger some uh, some uh, other other kind of memory which are hard to deal with. So it's up to you, but uh, these are guidelines uh, to help you basically. So basically, just watch for any uh, any potential. Uh, friction that you might choose if you choose a family member you just have a dispute with them or something you don't need all that maybe that's going to trigger some some past karma but uh, it's not completely sealed off so these are just suggestions suggestions and usually one day would say that person should be alive so uh, once again it, it tends to be a little bit easier to to actually generate this feeling to someone that you know and that you actually respect here and now and they're alive. Not that it's completely impossible if they're not, but uh, usually it tends to be a little bit easier. And so when you when you find this spiritual friend, uh, we usually advise to stay with it. And even though the mind might be tempted to move to another spiritual friend or another object, usually we advise to not, not follow the mind and actually try to stay with that one person that you chose. Because the mind will, uh, the mind is very sneaky. It works in many different ways. And so it will want to get distracted. So that's very normal that it will want to flow towards other other people, other things. But as I will say uh, later, we'll talk about the interviews later, there will be later interviews and we can talk about all of this personally uh, so that there's no problem. So feel feel assured that it's all good. So with this spiritual friend, you take that spiritual friend and you put it in your heart, basically, and you surround them with this beautiful, warm, glowing, radiating feeling of that loving kindness, God's love. And as you cultivate this, uh, the mind will become distracted. And that is for sure. <laughs> The mind will become distracted for sure. Uh, whether it's in 15 seconds or two minutes, doesn't matter. Anymore. <laughs> and so, a big, big part of this practice is what follows, and that's what we call the six parts. And that's completely, uh, basically, right effort with a mix of discernment, with a mix of panna, with a mix of also understanding and applying. More noble truths. And so, basically, the six R's are to recognize when the mind is distracted, to release that distraction, 
to relax the tension in the body that is caused by that distraction. To re-smile. Oh, that's interesting. To smile. To return to the metta. To return to the metta. And to repeat. So these are the six parts. And the six parts they kind of turn like a wheel. We learn as we go to know the six parts. So we will learn how to work with them very efficiently and very skillfully. So that was a brief overview of the six hours, uh, just so that you have uh, something to chew on. But uh, the six hours, if we break them down a little further, just to make things clear, uh, to recognize this is a certain pattern. This is also a of awareness. Uh, so this is supporting this whole path. If we were not able to recognize that the mind is distracted, and that there is tension arising in our body, then we could never practice. So this is also a training, a training in wisdom, a training in discernment. So to recognize, then to release. And this release, what is the difference between release and relax? Can somebody, can somebody tell the difference? Yes, I go with the thought. Yeah, so the release is mental and the relax is physical. So these are two actually very important steps. And the release first, uh, one needs to release the distraction to remove their attention from the distraction, to not feed our awareness into that distraction. So it's actually um, basically, uh, putting a stop to it, but simply withdrawing all its power. Because what feeds the distraction is our attention, our awareness, our leaning into it. So, oh yeah, that was a really nice memory, and then I did that, and then that person came out, it was lovely, and then all this, and that. And then it's, it's great, it's great, but. <laughs> Uh, mind is distracted, and then the feeling of metta disappears. It dissipates slowly, and then at some point, somebody is like, "Oh yeah, right, I was meditating 15 minutes ago." <laughs> and so, and this is completely normal. This is no problem at all. One will, that sooner or later, recognize whether it's two minutes after or half an hour after. Everything is possible. I see all of them, and. And then the relaxed step is probably the most important part. The, well, the relaxed and the smiling step are probably some of the most important parts. But um, the relaxed step is really uh, a <coughs> step that is actually taken uh, from, if you're familiar with the Anapasa, it's a Pasa 5, Kali Sankara. So this is where the Pate found that. What we're practicing here is principles from the Anapanasati, but not applied with the breath at all. We're just applying it with the ground practice, basically, just so you know what, what the six parts are. And um, for this, we need to understand that there is a really, really intimate connection between Nama and Rupa. And this intimate connection happens such that whenever the mind becomes distracted, agitated, it becomes, it starts thinking about this or that, there will assuredly be uh, tension in the body. And usually, one day would pull out this brain, this plastic brain, and say, I brought my brain today. So, <laughs> but I, I don't have it. Brain. <laughs> I don't have a plastic brain in that, so I'm not as lucky as I can. Um, and then he would explain that basically every time you're thinking, every time we're directing our mind, every time the mind is distracted, there is a contraction in 
the head that happens. And at the very beginning, it can even be in the fascia, in the fascia tissue of your body. Throughout your whole body, it could be in your shoulders, like when your shoulders become intense. You probably felt that before, you just start really like getting into a particular thinking habit, and then you, your, your shoulders and neck start to walk and move forward a bit. Well, in the coarser states of distractions, that can happen. But mainly as we go, it will, about, it will be about recognizing the slight tension that arises when the mind is distracted. And that happens every time. There is no maybe. It happens every time. So you can be sure of that. And from now on, try to see and recognize that, basically. And that is a major step of the path. Because when we go through the body to release, to relax attention, we actually leave the world of the mind. <laughs> and the, the world of the mind is very insubstantial and it's really easy to get lost in there. So if we just rely on the mind and think, oh yeah, I've let go of that thing. Actually, it's not really the go of. It's still there. There's still tension. There's still craving. It's very subtle. And it builds up. So we need to learn to So to tranquilize the body tension, the body tension, the body tension. And when we, when we do this, not only the mind has an impact on the body, but when we relax the body, we also release the mind. The body has an impact on the mind as well. So it's very amazing to witness that. When, when we let go of that tension, then the mind becomes open. We let go of craving. This is, this is the end of craving here and now. <laughs> Although it's not the end of the path, it is directly visible here and now, something people So we all have to wait uh, 10 years to see the fruit of that. Here and now, when we release the tension in the body, there is immediate relief. And that is also a very important to feel. So seeing that distraction arise, releasing the distraction, not keeping your awareness on it, not feeding your awareness to it, and then calming down, soothing the body, opening up, relaxing, relaxing the tension in the body. And then the mind also opens up and becomes beautiful, bright, alert, attentive. And that mind is a mind without craving. Or without with very little craving, and that's another love for Nelson's book. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think you, you've seen it, uh, and I think everybody is entitled to have one, right? Okay, so it's a, it's a gift to everybody here. So uh, whenever you have time, and then there are bookmarks also from the uh, community in Canada and Ireland. So and you, you are welcome to, to these. And so when, when we let go of the tension, uh, when we relax, the mind is open, the mind is clear, the mind is bright, the mind is without craving for at least that moment in time. And when we return to the metta, we return with a purified awareness, we return with an uplifted awareness. Lifted standard of mind, and that's how we actually get deeper in the practice or open up or, or uh, free the mind even more. Because if we were to come back without releasing and without relaxing, then it would, it would build up, and then we would, uh, sooner or later, we would hit a wall <laughs> it would progress. So, this is very important. 
And then there comes the, the, the one of the best parts of this uh, six hours is to really smile. So obviously you you understand that we were just trying to find a way to fill up another car in this, but it's simply a smile. <laughs> so just a brief smile. If it was gone, uh, re smile. And this is so underestimated. Um, but for those of you who have studied the different teachings of the Buddha, joy comes back over and over and over and over again in the early teachings. And the Buddha himself is praising it, uh, encouraging us and monks to develop joy, which is a factor of awakening. He calls it fiti. And so this joy is uh, fairly important. And how, how do we uh, cultivate joy in, a, in the easiest way, really? <coughs> so you can just smile. <laughs> and right there, and then, there is joy. And if, it, if there is not joy, uh, slowly it will make its way. And there were actually, we live in a very fortunate time because there were actually uh, scientific studies that were done, not just one, many actually, who studied, they, they put uh, a pen in people's mouth so that it would raise the, the corner of their mouths. It's a completely fake smile, but it works the same muscles. And they were trying to see if there would be uh, some kind of stimulation of joy and happiness, and it does. And so they, they call it fake it till you make it uh, approach. So that means uh, basically, even if you don't believe the smile is actually genuine and true, just that even if you would like to put a pen in your mouth, it would actually trigger the same synapses of your brain and the receptors and uh, in the long run, it would actually become lifting, even though we don't necessarily uh, believe it or uh, believe in it. Uh, so the, the smiling is very important, and that will keep your mind happy and light and lifted. So the first goal of this was to recognize release and relax. And this is about letting go. This is the fall of right effort that is about letting go, abandoning unwholesome states. And now we're moving towards the uplifting the mind, the cultivation of wholesome states and the maintaining of these wholesome states. And so when we smile, we can be sure that we are in the right place to practice metta. Smiling and metta will go perfectly hand in hand. They will uplift each other. The metta has very uplifting qualities also. And, um, and the smile will feed the metta also. So these states, they're not, you know, they're not cut and clear, separate. They nurture and foster each other. So, So by relaxing the tension, the mind is clear, it's open, it's bright, and then we give it a little boost, a little Buddha smile here, and a lot of people that think that the smile is only in on the lips, but it's also in the heart. A smile, put a smile in your heart, and a smile in your eyes also, and in your mind. Actually, uh, there was other studies that uh, revealed that true, genuine smile is, uh, they call it a new shame smile. And it's because uh, both the zygomatic major, this big muscle here that pulls up to the side of your mouth, and also the, I, can't, I forget the name of <laughs> that muscle, but another muscle who is actually lifting up the corners of your eyes also. So we're not actually just smiling from uh, the lips. We are also, when we generally smile, we smile from the eyes. 
But Bhante brought it even further and he said, a smile in your heart and a smile in your mind too. So then you will make very sure that you're on the right track. And then you come back to Metta and your mind is in this perfect state to actually take this vehicle of awareness, this resting place of awareness that is Metta, and rest your awareness in it, and that will carry your awareness for a long, long time by practicing like that. And it is effortless. The more we will practice, the more you will start to realize that this practice is moving towards less and less effort. So sometimes people want to really try hard at, at this practice, but actually this practice is about letting go and relaxing and actually taking a step back. Uh, putting too much effort will create restlessness and agitation and will simply move you out of metta and of joy. And often the meditation will uh, become dry because um, there's trying too hard. So be, be kind to yourself, be nice to yourself. And so that's, uh, that's about it for the instructions. Then, of course, there's the repeat. <laughs> but I think everybody understands. <laughs> so the repeat is simply we use the six R's when the mind is distracted. But when the mind is not distracted, we don't need to use them. We can just float on the mind and the smile. So this is ideally, this is what we want to be doing. Just floating on the mind or just being with your spiritual friend. And it's just blissful, amazing, great. That's suffusing all of your awareness. And and your mind isn't distracted. But when the mind does get distracted, then that's when we use the six R's. Basically, by that If the mind is a little bit distracted, but you're still with your spiritual friend, that's fine. No need the six R's. Just relax and stay with your object of meditation, stay with the vehicle of awareness that is metta until mind kind of drifts away completely or becomes completely hijacked and taken off completely from meditation. Then you can use the six R's. You will notice for sure there is tension and tightness in the head or the body and relax that relates to distraction. We smile and come back to that will be the meditation. This is a very dynamic meditation. The meditation will change all the time. It will not be the same for very long. So uh, that's why we have daily interviews, meditative interviews. It's not like uh, I, I will be giving instruction tonight and that's it for the rest of the 10 days. No, it's not like that. In fact, everybody will go through many landmarks steps and we will talk about these personally on interviews. So this is only a, where we start all together physically. And this personally uh, I am a Sutta lover and I support a lover of the discourses of the Buddha and I think uh, any kind of talk would be uh, incomplete if I were to leave the Buddha's words out. Um, so, very briefly, there's a very short sequence which I uh, truly uh, love that explains exactly this process that we just discussed uh, about how to use a spiritual friend and object of meditation to uplift the mind. And actually, this is including a principle which I underline every retreat is how the mind enters what we call the samadhi which uh, tends to be interpreted in many kinds of ways, mental collectiveness, or mental stability, or mental harmony. And here, uh, the Venerable Ananda is uh, teaching the Bhikkhunis, the, the nuns, and the 
every one of those uh, was uh, declared by the Sangha to be one of the monks that could teach them. So he was always going there. And they were making really great progress, in fact, uh, meditating the way they were doing with the Sangha and the forest and places of awareness. And the Buddha uh, hears about this, and uh, this is the interaction between the Venerable and the Buddha. Uh, when the Venerable declares that the Bhikkhudis are doing a lot of progress and they're doing really very well, and the Buddha replies, <coughs> Here on the one minute, it's Aware of the body as body, intent, fully aware and present, letting go of tension and distractions. As one meditates, aware of body as body, and well, this is not completely separate from what we're doing, this is talking about the Sakyatanas for those of you who know, but you know, when we're suffusing metta in the whole body, you know, it's, it's not the void of this awareness of body, it's actually very close, it's developing it. <clears throat> so as one will meditate, <clears throat> resting awareness upon body or resting awareness upon the metta, your spiritual friend, bodily discomfort arising as one's mind becomes lazy or dull or distracted outwardly. So this is really what we just discussed. The mind will be distracted at some point. Then one should apply one's mind to an uplifting object. By doing so, gladness arises. From gladness comes joy. Joyful in mind, one's body is relaxed. See how these states really work together. Relaxed in body, one experiences happiness, and a happy mind becomes collected. Supino chikman sabhaviya. So this is how the Buddha the mind gets collected. So this is very important to know, and I will be repeating that sequence. So, there is more to say about this, uh, but I guess I'm done. So, afterwards, one reflects this is the reason why I have applied my mind, so the, the spiritual friend. My intention was fulfilled, I can now let it go because the mind is collected, uh, now it's, it's good, it's still. One then lets it go that neither thinks nor imagines, and one goes, not thinking nor imagining, I am happy, present, in living. So this points out to not putting too much effort. So really, as it moves on, uh, we will learn to not hold on to the spiritual plan so tightly. It's fine. It, it, it will slowly relax. So the spiritual friend will still be there, but we will allow it to be more of a relaxed kind of awareness. But this we will talk about the morning. So this was the very short sutta uh, on this uh, one principle that I had to early on in the retreat. And so, um, now a bit more on, this was really more like a meditation instruction, now more on moving forward. Uh, you, you are likely not going to be sitting for 10 days straight. <laughs> so, there are a few things to consider around that. So you will be standing up, you will be alternating between sitting and walking meditation. Um, 
everybody here will be at different stages. So that's why the schedule that we will discuss a little bit in very soon here uh, is flexible. It's made so that there are one big block, a free block for meditation and personal you know, activity meditation, whether it's walking, sitting, or uh, if you need to take rest, then resting also because there will be meals around these and so the schedule is quite free. There are a big block in the morning and a big block in the afternoon. The advanced meditators can sit for these long three, four, five hour long sits. And those who sit for less have the opportunity to manage their own basically schedule of alternating between uh, often we would recommend starting with at least 45 minutes sitting and then you can go and do some walking meditation maybe for 20 minutes, half an hour, and however you feel that is good for you. And while you are sitting, standing, laying down, any other posture. That's the beauty of right effort, is that it's the same all the time. <laughs> it doesn't change. So when we develop wholesome states, we develop wholesome states, period. That is called the bhavana. So with the bhavana, it's 24 7, it happens all the time. Sitting, we go deeper. We, can, we have this opportunity to release deeper our minds. But our sitting practice will reflect also what we do after the sitting. So if we're completely mindless, if we start talking, completely lose our awareness, then, then the sitting will take a lot longer. So, uh, while walking, take drinking, eating, going to the bathroom, taking a shower, laying down on the bed, always remain with your object of meditation, your vehicle of awareness, uh, with your spiritual friend. Whenever the mind gets distracted, six hours, smile, and uh, have fun. Because the more you do this, the more you will have fun. The more it will be very happy, blissful, and very calm, very peaceful. So usually a Monday would be pathetic about exercise and walking meditation. So make sure, please, that you walk at least an hour. For me, I usually say an hour and a half total in your day. Or two hours even. Um, because sitting for long periods of time, um, if you're sitting for four hours sits, for those of you who are advanced meditators, make sure you get the exercise in. Have a four story building here. Not able to be quite keen on putting some people uh, up and down the stairs. Uh, he does that in Namasuka quite a bit. Um, and so it's, it's common to see people going up and down the stairs and their, their heart rate going while maintaining their object of meditation. It's not impossible, actually, it's very impossible. But you have to be mindful of this. Um, or, uh, yeah, make sure that you get some exercise in, and that will really help for the pain and for sitting, so it will be very beneficial. Uh, for those of you who uh, have experienced this before, uh, on your sits, please, uh, you're welcome to use the chairs. So if you're sitting for three or four hours, uh, make sure that you're in a comfortable position, that there's no pain that will actually become um, worse uh, or uh, that you won't injure yourself, basically. It's kind of a funny thing because people think you can't really injure yourself while meditating, but you can. <laughs> and um, I knew my knee a couple of times, so uh, that wasn't in this kind of meditation power. <laughs> and that's why we, we learned, a few of us have learned, and uh, when we encountered this 
uh, type of meditation, it was a big revelation on that side too. Sitting in chairs actually allows your body to be comfortable and to sit for much longer. And to allow your mind to sink in much deeper and to be released. Okay, so around um, maybe a retreat organization and um, day to day life, uh, maybe you want to get more of these stuff. So this will be a silent retreat. Uh, usually we, uh, we promote normal silence, which allows a little bit of room for you know, talking wholesomely or things like that. But the experience with that is usually that it doesn't work that well. <laughs> and people become a little too chatty. And this doesn't mean that it's unwholesome, but it will disturb the mind. It will activate more sound which will need to be let go of afterwards. So this will be a silent retreat. Please only speak uh, to, to, to me, come uh, to me if you'd like to speak, or uh, one of the organizers, uh, feel free, but please try to respect everyone else's practices and, uh, and yours also respect your own practices. So that will really benefit you. Um, I think we will be grabbing cell phones. Uh, you were mentioning that you were at, at any point. I think is it you're going to be in charge of grabbing cell phones? Okay. Yeah, this one is for the camera. <laughs> Yes, yes, also. So, well, uh, maybe when I'm going to talk, okay. I'm almost done, don't worry. It's almost over. I don't know how long I've been talking. <laughs> anyway, it's from the day zero, it's like, I'm not seeing it. Okay, so, schedule. So we elaborated a scheme here. The schedule will be wake up bell at 5 in the morning, uh, gathering here at 5.30. Uh, we will be uh, reciting the verses of the Dhammapada, uh, the 10 first verses. And uh, taking the refuges and the precepts, which is a Came of faith in this tradition. This, is, this happens every day at 5 30. And so at 6, there is a group meditation until 7. And then 7 is breakfast. And don't worry, there won't be a test on this at the end of the talk. You don't have to remember, actually, we'll give you a cheat sheet and it's got the whole schedule on it, so that's fine. But we just get an uh, overview right now. So, 7 is the breakfast, 7.30-ish, that is, you know, you don't have to swallow up the, the rest of your oatmeal or whatever you're eating if it's 7.31 or something, don't worry. And it's just kind of guideline, which I mean, usually breakfast is quite fast anyways. So, afterwards, 7.30 onwards, this is when uh, the Meditation block begins in the morning. So, meditation, sitting or walking, or if you feel like taking a bit of rest. And I do encourage you to be kind with yourself in the first few days. Please, if you need to take a nap, take a nap. Don't try to plow through it. Don't try to drink four coffees and you know stay awake. Uh, that's not going to help you. You're just going to crash later. Uh, so. Really, uh, if you want to sleep a little bit more, uh, beginning a retreat can be a little bit intense sometimes, coming from the home environment to a completely new you know, like at 5 in the morning, meditating all day. So if you need to take a nap, take a nap. It's no problem. You'll see, actually, you'll have the energy afterwards to meditate. 
and take the profit in, so that will be a benefit to you. Then at nine, uh, we will begin uh, meditators' interviews, and this will be on my uh, the porch of my cookie at the second floor. Uh, we will come up with uh, because there's quite a few of us here, uh, and so we will have to make groups and have group interviews because I'm the only teacher here now. So I won't be able to sit uh, with everybody individually, uh, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we, we can get everybody uh, on the right track. And um, usually there are no uh, meditation interviews on day one tomorrow, but I feel like I would like to do them tomorrow anyways because I want to get to to know everybody, to know where you're coming from, what's your meditation experience, how you're doing, and um, also take a little bit advanced because it's it's a big group, so uh, so that we're we're on track for the rest of the Um So from nine to eleven, that will be uh, interviews, and we will come up with a schedule. We'll put everybody's names will be with a group of either probably around three three people and just come to the group at the time slot allocated for your uh, interview basically that's what it's going to be then uh, at 11 there's going to be lunch uh, <laughs> uh, I will uh, I will be coming for a bit of time for those of you who know what this is uh, on ground or Anyone who wants to actually pick a little bowl or a spoonful of rice or curry or whatever it is, doll, you can offer it in a bowl. So that's an opportunity at 11. <coughs> and then uh, I believe at 12 is the end of the lunch because usually those who take the eight presets, uh, noon is the limit for eating, which is my limit also. Uh, then from 12, from 12 onwards, there will be, uh, again, the afternoon block. So whether you're meditating, sitting, walking meditation, or uh, taking a little bit of rest at some point, uh, that is up to you. Uh, if you're meditating an hour sitting, and then half an hour walking, and then that is completely up to you. And then we will catch up on the interviews and time you through that. Then hmm. 12.30 will be the afternoon interview, so there's no way we can do all this in the, the morning, so we will overflow in the afternoon for probably a couple of hours. So same thing is going to be on the schedule, and we'll try to keep the same schedule every day, so that if there's no confusion, you know exactly when you're supposed to come, and so that's it. Um, 12.30, then we said, Five thirty is tea time. I'm told that uh, tea is somewhat available all the time. I think, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I like. Uh, tea is just available for your own pickup at any time. Uh, but there is a more specific tea time, which is at five thirty, uh, and an hour later. Than and um, you can have tea time or you don't have to. That's really, it's, you know, it's, it's very uh, up to you. <laughs> it's optional. Uh, and then you, there is the devil talk at seven in here, obviously. And uh, at nine, there is uh, taking rest or personal meditation. Some people like to meditate further into the night. That is really up to you. Dhamma, Dhamma discourses will be around an hour, an hour and a half uh, every night. Rarely should go beyond that. I'll try to not do that with you. <laughs> um, I 
think that covers it. I think that's pretty good. Now, uh, we have some sheets to give to you. There is a meditation experience, a uh, little sheet that uh, I'm asking you to please kind of fill out with your experience in meditation and bring to me on the first interview tomorrow. And then I can know what, where you're coming from. Uh, and then I can actually connect, know your name, put a face on the name and everything so that will help me a lot. And so, uh, we will distribute that. Come on.